we'll get started. Uh, okay, uh, before I get started today, let's see if I can do a little bit of bookkeeping. So I think the in-class iClicker registration worked out pretty well. So what I've done is I've put together a list of the registered iClickers with the serial number. So I'll tell you about that in a moment. The other is, if you've looked in the grade book, you should find a four-digit pin that I assigned. It says pin for posting grades. These are just random four-digit numbers that I assign. They have no bearing on your Z number or anything else. So, and I'm the only one who has them. So in terms of privacy of your grade and such, the only way someone's going to know what your pin is is if you tell them. Um, now, what I'd like to do is, so one is look on this table that I'm going to post. So I'm going to post the list on Blackboard, and it's going to have the, the serial numbers by the PIN numbers. Also, I don't know, I'm always impressed by, you know, with Boca sort of being, and especially South Florida, the mecca for financial fraud and such, that these people would come up with these different schemes. It's like, I wish I was that smart. I just come up with really, so I don't know whether having a full functional iClicker number might be useful to somebody in some way. So what I'm going to do is I've published, I'll put on the list the serial numbers, but I've deleted the first two numbers, the numbers or the letters. So it's, an it's only the last six characters of your serial number. Look at that serial number. Match it to the pin. The pin is what's in my spreadsheet. As long as that, now you'll know what number I'm going to use for posting your grades. And if that matches up with your serial number, then you're good to go. Or it says no iClicker registered. If you're, if you're not going to use an iClicker, it is optional, then that's fine. If you've been trying to register and it says no iClicker registered, then send me an email and probably all I need is just the serial number from your iClicker and we can solve the problem. Uh, let's see, the other... Okay, what you may find when you look at the, those last six alphanumeric number for your serial number, you may find one, possibly two, but maybe one digit off. That was a, a quirk in the software. But as long as it's on there, it means your eye clicker is working. If the number is clearly wrong, then it means that someone else's eye clicker has been registered to your name. And that can happen when you do the online registration. So if the number is just clearly wrong, send me an email, come by my office, and we'll get it fixed. So let's see if that will solve at least 95% uh, or so of any of the registration questions. Otherwise, if it shows up there on the list, the number's right, you're good for the rest of the semester. Any questions about that? I'll probably put that up either tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay. So today we're going to do Chapter 4. We'll probably, we may or may not finish it. We'll probably get most of the way through it. So what I'll be doing is why don't you go no later than 20 till, maybe even 25 tills, so we have enough time to walk over for the seminar. So this is chapter four, and this is on sex determination, sex-linked characteristics. If from general biology you've already know about X and Y and sex-linked inheritance and color blindness and hemophilia and such, this chapter is going to expand more on that, including an idea of so-called sex determination, and that is most, not all, but most species have two distinct sexes, just male and female. There's a genetic mechanism by which that the programming of that individual is, this individual is going to develop as male or is going to develop as female. At the first part of this chapter, I'm going to show you a few examples of other systems that aren't just the XY system that you know about. The XY system is the most common, and that's the one we'll come back to, and then we'll talk a little bit about the underlying mechanisms that are involved in it. Uh, if I don't happen to mention it now, who's going to be here on Monday? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay, but if, but you need okay. So this will be next Wednesday. That was just my way of reminding you that Monday is actually a holiday. Okay, but if you come in on Monday, parking will be easy. You'll be able to get a parking spot. It should be no problem at all. So it'd be next Wednesday. We're going to try chapter five. This one is so-called non-Mendelian inheritance. At least I think this may be one of the more challenging chapters for students. The idea is the genetic transmission mechanisms that Mendel laid out remain in play, but 
we talked about how Mendel had some very specific factors working in his favor, these things like penetrance and such. That's not what happens out in the real world. And so what that chapter contains is a lot of different examples, including something called epistatic interactions and such, that are still Mendelian, but the phenotype is different. And so I just think that's a chapter you really do want to look at and read ahead of time, because I think there's a lot of stuff in there that at first is going to be a little bit confusing and may take a little longer to figure out. Okay, so here's chapter four. One of the things I'll show you some examples is we define sex by phenotype. We look at individuals and we say they're male or female. But I'll show you some examples where you can have an individual who appears to be female, for instance, but in fact, if you look at their chromosomes, they're in fact chromosomally male. So it has to do with how these genes are expressed. All right. Um, for instance, uh, here's another example. This is, a, this is another one I'll give you later on. We, there are individuals, in, this holds in mammals, so let's just use humans. Uh, males who are actually genetically female in that they have two X chromosomes. So if you looked at their chromosomes on the microscope, if you didn't know who that sample came from, you'd say, yes, this was a female, but in fact, they are males, and that's because the Y chromosome, which is very small, has actually been attached to another chromosome, and it wasn't found until a little bit later. So they can look chromosomally to be one sex, but in fact, phenotypically are another sex. I'll give you a couple of examples as we go along. Okay. And then there's always hermaphrodites, which bring a snicker from everyone. All right. There are some organisms which are true hermaphrodites. And C. elegans, this soil nematode, which is one of these genetic models that we work with, Dr. Gia uses this in his studies, is a true hermaphrodite, at least in one part of its life cycle. So it has both male and female parts, reproductive parts, and can self-fertilize. So we use the term monoecious here in that there's really, the individual can have both sexes in one. But this is the exception. Most organisms, including humans and mammals and such, are dioecious. That is, they have distinct male and female members. Okay. What I'm going to do is show you a few examples, although it's all genetic at the end, some different systems for determining sex, whether you develop as male or female, that are influenced either genetically, chromosomally, or also by environmental factors. And some of these you may already know about, for instance, with development of sea turtles and such. So we'll just sort of give you this sort of overview of some of these other systems. Then we'll come back to the XY system that you're most familiar with, and that occurs the most often. Okay. So chromosomal sex determination. The X chromosome was identified in insect cells in 1891. So this was probably about 30 years or so after Mendel died, but his work was published. But nobody yet at that point knew what, about chromosomes. So they're looking at them microscopically. They, these grasshoppers are a nice model system because they only have a few very large, very distinct chromosomes. Uh, so people are starting to look at these these nuclei as they're going through mitosis and such. They didn't really understand what this X chromosome was doing at the time. It was just distinctive in the sense that after they looked at it for a while, what they found was if the cells came from female grasshoppers, there were two of these chromosomes. But if they came from males, there was only one. For all of the other chromosomes, there was two copies, whether it came from males or females. So there was a di distinction in the X chromosomes, depending on which sex the cells came from. <coughs> Looked at it a little more, a little further, and what they found was, not surprising, half of the sperm contained an X chromosome, but all of the eggs from the females, all 100% have the X chromosome. So if nothing else, at this point, it provided unequivocal proof that the genes are associated with chromosomes, but they didn't still yet understand what the sex chromosomes were doing. Now, in grasshoppers, the system that they're looking at, this is what we call an XXXO system. There is no Y chromosome. There's just the X chromosomes. Two X chromosomes, you develop as a female. One X chromosome, you develop as a male. So that's all the O is. It just indicates the absence of a sex chromosome. So as it shows here, two X zygotes develop as females, or 
since all of the eggs have an X chromosome, but half of the sperm lack a sex chromosome, if that egg's fertilized by a sperm lacking the sex chromosome, then there'll just be one X and that will individual develop as a male. Okay, so it's just like the XY system except change the Y to the absence of a chromosome. This XXXY is the most common one that we know about and the one you're most familiar with. Again, females have two X chromosomes. Male have one X and a smaller Y chromosome. <coughs> We'll talk a little bit later about uh, how the Y chromosome appears evolutionarily to be derived from the X chromosome, but it's lost nearly all of the sequences on the, on the X. Um, also, most a lot of the Y chromosomes are acrocentric, so they don't really look Y-shaped. It's just a designation. Okay. So to have some terminology that I can put on the exam, males are heterogametic just means different gametes, hetero different gametes. They produce different gametes, either with sperm with either an X or a Y. Females are homogametic. That is, all of the gametes, all of the eggs, have the same chromosome composition, an X chromosome. Okay. Any questions? Pretty straightforward. All right. However, let's put it this way. So the, the key reason that we're going to see sex-linked inheritance of recessive traits like colorblindness, hemophilia, and such, is because males have one copy of the X. Therefore, they only have one copy of all the genes on the X because the Y chromosome shares very little similarity to the X. And so most, nearly all of the genes on the X chromosome are missing from the Y. Okay? However... The X and the Y chromosome have to pair during meiosis. They need some kind of homology so that they pair up properly that process of synapsis that we talked about so that recombination can occur. And so on the very, and as I said, it's thought that this Y chromosome actually evolutionarily was an X chromosome that's been losing sequences over time. Right here on the tips of the Y chromosome, this little dark region, actually is shared homology with the X chromosome. So it's called the pseudo-autosomal region. Why would it, what would that mean? Okay. If, if, you had, if you're looking at a gene that's part of the pseudo-autosomal region, would it show sex-linked inheritance? No. That's why it's pseudo-autosomal. Any gene, and there's not going to be many, that's in that, that shared region between the X and the Y, its inheritance, if you're doing an experiment to see if it was sex link, your data would tell you it's actually on an autosome. So it's pseudo in that it's sort of quasi-autosomal, but it's only down in this very small shared region. The ZZZW sex determination. It's exactly the same as the XXY, except in this case, the female is a heterogametic. The female is the one with two different sex chromosomes, and the male has two copies of the same sex chromosome. So they're just using Z and W to make that distinction. Because it shows you here, females are ZW, two different sex chromosomes. The males have the same sex chromosomes. And you see this in, as it says, birds, moths, and amphibians. So there's a significant number of species actually use this system. Works the same way, except females are the heterogamete. Okay. All right. A genic sex determination system, and one of these days I want to look this up because I think the pea plants that Mendel was working with probably fall in this system, and that is there are genes that are involved in sex determination between the corresponding male and female equivalents in plants. Okay. But those genes are scattered around the genome on different chromosomes. There's no distinct sex chromosome, which I'm guessing is why Mendel never saw sex-linked inheritance, why he always found that reciprocal crosses gave the same result. It didn't matter whether it was the male or the female that had the mutation. You got the same outcome. If these pea plants actually have sex chromosomes and he didn't see sex-linked inheritance because none of the genes 
that he was working with her on the X chromosome, then it just continues to go to his luck factor. Okay, and he should have been playing the lottery instead. <laughs> so what you have is there's genes involved in sex determination, determining whether this individual is going to develop as male or female. But if you look at the chromosomes, let's say under the light microscope, you don't see any differences. You couldn't tell whether these cells came from the male or from the female. Okay. So here's this important point. Even though it's chromosomes and such, the sex determination is based on genes. We're going to come back to this as this example. In mammals, you have a gene called SRY. It's the master regulator. It, in fact, codes for the first protein product that sets off a cascade of events that leads to male determination. So in mammals, sort of the default pathway is going to be to develop as a female. If you don't have the SRY gene, you don't have the product of the SRY, we'll talk about that a little bit later, then the default pathway is to become female. So it's not so much that you have to have a Y chromosome to develop as male in mammals, but rather you need a copy of the SRY gene, which is on the Y chromosome. Yes? In females, this is back, we're back on the same XY situation. So only males will have the Y chromosome. But the important point here is it's really this one gene on the Y chromosome that's important. It's not the presence of the Y chromosome itself. But that's where that gene resides. So if you don't have the gene on the Y Notice if you have a mutated SRY, then you can look chromosomally. Somebody can look at the cells and go, this must be a male because it's, it's an XY. But in fact, you're going to look like a female. And I'll give you another example that you probably already know about, androgen and sensitivity <coughs> syndrome, which is another downstream event. That's all coming from this. So one thing to start thinking about in terms of genetics is they tend to work in these hierarchical cascading events. There's some master regulator up here that affects the expression here, and that affects the expression here. And if there's a mistake anywhere along the way, then you have problems. And I'll give you a, later I'll give you a few examples from Drosophila. This is where that gene sex lethal comes in, and one called transformer, and one called double sex, and such. Okay. Another one you probably know a little bit about because of the sea turtles are env environmental factors. So it's still genetic, but it's which genes get turned on based on upon the environmental factors. So it might be temperature. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. This is an example. It's a classic example out of your textbook. This is actually something we'll call sequential hermaphrodism. Probably actually a pretty interesting life. Okay. So here, it's sex is determined by the interaction of the genes and the environment. So these little slipper limpets, okay, they're uh, marine organisms. I assume it's marine. The life begins in a free-swimming larvae. So they're out in the ocean. They've got to find a place to settle down. So these first larvae start to settle on some rock somewhere that hasn't been colonized yet. Oops. And they settle into that substrate and they all develop as females. They get lonely, and then they start to secrete a pheromone to attract other larvae to come join the colony. Those larvae settle on top of the females, but they develop as males. They then serve as the mates, okay, so that now you can have more larvae, but eventually those males will become females, so that they can mate with the males who are going to be settling on top of the Colony, so it's a. <laughs> you know, when you're not worrying about uh, retirement plans and health insurance and such, you can just do this stuff. Okay, so the new females, they secrete the pheromone that attracts uh, more larvae. Those larvae become males. Eventually, they become females, and this process just continues until you have this stack of a dozen or more animals that are all females except at the very top are males. Okay? Sounds like some psychological issue, but that's okay. <laughs> so that's what you have. So it's called sequential hermaphrodism because each individual can be either sex, but not at the same time. The C. elegans are true hermaphrodites, at least in one of their life cycles, one of their life stages. They can actually 
They're, they have reproductive organs for both sexes. One you're more familiar with, this happens with a lot of turtles and alligators, snakes, lizards, and such. It's temperature. Um, so the idea here is this developing embryo has all the genes needed to either develop as a male or a female, which genes get turned on, which ones get expressed, are based on temperature, an environmental cue. So for turtles, a warmer position, so it's basically the position in the nest will dictate whether to develop as a male or female. Higher temperatures, a warmer position in the nest produces females, cooler temperatures give you males, and just to make it complicated, other organisms are the reverse. So you can't really predict. It's not always females develop from warmer temperatures, males from cooler temperatures. It it's differs among the different species. But again, it's an environmental trigger interacting with the gene expression to determine which sex will develop. Okay. Now here's one we're going to talk about a lot. And so what I'm going to be doing is comparing and contrasting the system in Drosophila with that of mammals. The overarching idea here is, or the way I think about some of this stuff, the organism has to solve a certain problem, and it, it has taken a certain approach. What I'm going to show you is in some of these cases, the same problem exists for both the fruit flies and the mammals. They've, they've, the outcome is the same, but they've solved it in different ways. So they've used a different path to get to the same endpoint. So in Drosophila, uh, we've talked about this before, but just to review it, so there's a somatic cell in Drosophila has eight chromosomes. So it has four homologous pairs, three pairs of autosomes, and one pair of sex chromosomes. Males usually have one X chromosome, female two X chromosomes. So it's, it's identical to what you're familiar with. Males have also typically have a Y chromosome. What's different here, as we begin to compare and contrast, I just told you that in mammals, you have to have the Y chromosome, specifically that SRY gene. In Drosophila, the Y chromosome is not, will not be used for sex determination. The Y chromosome is needed for, there's some genes on the Y chromosome for sperm development. So males lacking the Y chromosome will be sterile. But the Y chromosome is not needed in terms of setting the stage of whether developing as a male or female. What sets that, that cascade of events into play is the ratio of X chromosomes to the autosomes. The Y chromosome doesn't factor into this at all. Okay? So it's what we call this X to A ratio. So this is the number of haploid sets of autosomes. So under normal conditions, a diploid cell A would be what? Two. There's normally, I'll give you, a, I'll have an eye clicker question in a minute and won't go into the genetics, but there's ways of forcing Drosophila to have more than just one pair of homologous chromosomes. So normally, that A would be 2. If the X to A ratio is 1, then it leads into female development. Well, females normally have two X's. Two, a, two sets of, of the uh, A is going to be 2 because you've got two haploid sets. 2 divided by 2 is 1. If the ratio is 0.5, which you would have with males, because there's only one X chromosome, then development follows a pathway for male development. Okay. Now, without going into how to get these ratios, let's just say you can. If that X to A ratio is greater than 0.5, but less than 1, you can get an intersex. You can, in fact, get a fly that anatomically has male and female parts. These animals are dead. They don't, they're very inviolable and such. But you can see that that X day ratio is between 0.5 and 1. It's, it's triggering a little bit in both pathways. And so you get a so-called intersex, which has both. If the ratio is below 0.5, you get metamales. They look like males, but they're weak, they're sterile, and they usually die. Or you can go in the opposite. If the ratio is greater than 1, you can get metafemales, 
which look like females, but again, they have developmental problems and they usually die. But it's this ratio, and from you know, people worked on this for a long time. Is what's the molecular basis of this counting mechanism? That's counting how many are there. Okay. To sort of preview a little bit of where we're going down the road, since we already talked about sex lethal. The sex lethal protein is only produced in females, so it's only made when the ratio is one. Sex lethal then turns will then turn on expression of a gene called transformer and another gene called double sex. Males don't have sex lethal because it's not made when the ratio is 0.5, and so those other pathways don't function. So it's sort of at the top of this hierarchy and sets the cascade into event into into uh, into process. So with flies, I mean, there's a lot of genetic tricks you can do with this. A fly that's XXY, if it was, if this was a human XXY, would be male or female? It'd be male because of the Y chromosome if there's a functional SRY. In Drosophila, because it's two X's, even though there's a Y there, this is actually a perfectly normal fertile female. So an XXY female in Drosophila is indistinguishable from a normal XX female. Right. So the Y chromosome seems to have no effect. The presence of the Y has no effect in females. Flies that lack it, if you have a fly that's XO, that lacks, has a 1X, but lacks the Y chromosome, it will look like a perfectly normal male, but he'll be sterile. Because the Y chromosome does have genes that are needed for sperm development. So the animal will be sterile, but will look like a perfectly normal male. Okay. Okay, so here's just, again, going back to these couple genes. We won't go into the genetics of it, but just tell you a little more about what they do. So, for instance, this whole process, sex lethal protein will affect the expression of this gene called the tra gene or transformer, it gets its name because if you have a normal female with an X-day ratio of one, but she has a mutation in the tra gene, she'll develop as a male. Because the SXL protein can't interact with the transformer correctly, and therefore <laughs> it thinks it's a male developmental pathway. Double sex acts just downstream of transformer. Here, these mutations cause normal males and females to take that, have that intersex phenotype where they have characteristics of both. Okay, so later on when we get into the more deeper into the genetics of sex determinate in determining in, in determining sex, which one is going to develop. More importantly is that well I'll get to it in a minute. Oops I got it. Uh, yeah, hang on. Here we go. As we said it's really this SRY gene and I'll show you a couple of experimental results that really argue why it is in fact the SRY gene, not just simply the fact that it's the Y chromosome. Okay, so there's a number, there's a several syndromes. You've probably heard of some of these before. They're linked to imbalances in sex chromosomes. Mammals and humans included seem to tolerate imbalances in the number of sex chromosomes. There's always some developmental issues, some different issues, but at least they're viable, they have some tolerance for it. Except for things like Down syndrome with three copies of the autosomes, they really don't tolerate chromosome imbalances with any of the other chromosomes. So the question might be, why would it be a problem if you have three copies of chromosome eight? You just have some extra genetic information, all the genes are there. That's a lethal situation. The reason, in sort of looking ahead, the reason that is probably tolerated with the sex chromosomes is because all but one of the X chromosomes is going to become inactivated. So we'll get to that in a minute. So you have Turner syndrome, which are females with a single X chromosome. So they're XO. Uh, you usually have some secondary sex characteristics are underdeveloped and some other, here's some other phenotypes. Uh, a lot of these individuals, for many years, it was thought that they had mental deficiencies and such. But in many cases, the intelligence is nearly normal. It's just these children were kind of ignored because they didn't, they didn't look normal. But they're, you know, they're quite viable. 
Interesting thing is there's no known case of an individual with no X chromosome. So what does that tell you? There's some genes on the X chromosome that are absolutely essential for development. Okay. So probably any fetus is lacking one X chromosome, and that can happen through something called non-disjunction. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Probably are just spontaneous abortions. In fact, probably most spontaneous abortions are going to be the result of what we call an aneuploidy, non-equal distribution of the chromosomes. Kleinfelter syndrome, these are males who have one or more Y chromosomes and some multiple X chromosomes. I don't know if they still talk about this in the psychology courses. There was a study by a very well-known psychologist or psychiatrist, I'm not sure, who was convinced that males who had two Y chromosomes were much more aggressive, and therefore he could predict individuals who would have aggressive behavior and were probably likely to get caught up into the criminal system and such. And what he found was in prisons, the proportion of men with two Y chromosomes is slightly higher than out at the, in the normal population. Well, everybody bought that for a long time until it turned out all the data was fudged. But since he fabricated the data because he knew the answer, he just had to make the data give him the result that he wanted, and he'd already had a good reputation, so people bought into it. The second is, yes, there is a higher percentage of males in prison who have two Y chromosomes, but they tend to be there for more petty offenses, burglary and such, which probably just means they're just not as smart as the average criminals and such, and so they end up in prison, but they're not there for violent crimes and such. Okay, so the typically for Kleinfelder syndrome would be XXY, so it doesn't really matter, in mammals, it doesn't matter how many X's you have, the presence of the Y chromosome will set off this male developmental pathway. Okay, they have some of the same type of uh, phenotypic characteristics in terms of underdeveloped secondary sex characteristics. Often are unusually tall, but again, intelligence can be close to normal. You can also have poly X females, the most common being the triplo X syndrome, that is, they have three X chromosomes, but you can go even to higher numbers. As we'll talk about in a few minutes, because all but one X chromosome becomes inactivated, that's probably why this is a tolerable situation. You might have three X chromosomes, but only one will be functional, two will be inactivated. All right. So here, what's the role of the sex chromosomes? As we said, the X chromosome clearly has genes that are absolutely essential for development. So you have to have at least one functional copy of the X chromosome in order to develop. The Y chromosome has this male determining gene, and so the presence of the Y chromosome always leads to male development, and the absence of the Y chromosome always leads to female development, assuming the SRY gene is functional. Okay, they also have, the X and Y chromosomes also have genes involved in fertility, and so what you do find with females, they need at least two X chromosomes to be fertile. So the XO, Individuals will also usually be sterile. Um, all right. So let's look a little more closely at this male determining gene, sort of what the master regulator for sex determination. So again, in mammals, female development is going to be the default pathway. If you don't have SRY gene and its gene product, then it develops as female. So the Y chromosomes needed for development. But as I said earlier, there were known examples of males who, when you looked at their karyotype, they have two X chromosomes and apparently no Y chromosome. What they found was it was a translocation. That is, the Y chromosome had become associated with one of the autosomes. So the Y chromosome was present, but it was it's so small and it was attached to this other bigger chromosome, until you looked very carefully, you didn't see it. The main thing was the SRY gene was still there. So it's not the Y chromosome so much as the presence of the SRY gene. Okay. So SRY got its. Yes? Okay. 
okay. So what you would have here is an individual who looks to be male. And when you look at the chromosomes and you look at a karyotype, you would expect XY karyotype. But in fact, they were XX. You could do the reverse if you gave this to the technician and that person would say, oh, this must have come from a female. So they could be, if they were XO, okay, so your question would be, if I'm following this, you would have somebody who looks like male, you do the karyotype, but you only see one X chromosome, and no Y chromosome? Well, with the thing where you said the Y chromosome is attached to one chromosome? Right. No, no. What would happen is, if if you had an individual who was X O. Oh, this is sets up as too nice a question for the exam. <laughs> so you basically have somebody with like Tanner Turner syndrome, who's X O, but in fact, let's say the father had a Y chromosome that had been attached to chromosome two. So the daughter would have inherited, although she lacked although she lacked the next chromosome, so it, her karyotype would look like XO, the fact that this SRY gene being on the Y chromosome is attached to autosome 2, if she inherited that from the father, she would develop as a male. But karyotypically, it would look like this Turner syndrome until you look carefully. Because the Y chromosome is very, very small. So having it actually physically attached to one of the other chromosomes, so it travels with it through meiosis, um, wouldn't be picked up unless somebody was looking for it very carefully. Did that, did that answer your question? Good question. I should have saved that for an exam. Okay. So this is this SRY gene. It gets its name for sex-determining region of the Y. All right. Some of the evidence that this is really what the, is the master regulator, not the Y chromosome, is, again, finding XX males. Uh, that's, that's present in XX males, and it's missing in XY females. So it could be the same thing. You could have a female whose chromosomes carry typically look like they're XY, but the SRY gene is, is mutated, non-functional. They're going to develop as females because you need the product, which we'll talk about in a minute, the product of the SRY gene. To show it a little more elegantly, you can make transgenic mice. So transgenic animals are animals where we manipulated some DNA sequence in a test tube and then introduced those DNA sequences into their genomes. So these are called germline transformations. So you genetically alter these animals. Yes? Um, when you say it's found in XX males, are you saying that the SRY gene is in the autosomal Yes, that would be that kind of a situation. Where they look, you see two X chromosomes, but in fact they're developing as male. Right, but probably what's going on here is that Y is now a, that small little Y chromosome is part of another autosome. So it's telling you that even though it's not just the two X chromosome, that there's some other gene, and then they find that it's actually on a translocation. Or here, this individual has a mutated SRY gene, so the chromosomally they should have been male, but they actually developed. Here shows it a little more elegantly. You can take transgenic mice who are, have two X chromosomes who would develop as females, but put in an engineered copy of the SRY gene. So now you're making the product of the SRY gene, and they develop as males. So that's showing you very elegantly that it's not the Y chromosome, but in fact it's that specific gene is needed to set off the, the pathway for, y, for male development. Okay. Um, now, they're sterile because there are genes on the Y chromosome that are needed for gamete development. The master regulator gene is there. Doesn't mean the whole system's going to work. So what we're going to be looking at here is a situation where the SRY gene is functional. It makes the normal gene product, but that gene product then carries out a second event. That's working normally, but the third event is broken. And so if anything breaks down in that process, then the whole system begins to break down. So these genes oftentimes work in this cascade event. Okay. 
So there are genes in, other than SRY that are critical for sex development. SRY is just the master regulator. It begins this process. So individuals who have androgen and sensitivity syndrome, uh, externally they look like they're female. However, at puberty they fail to start to menstruate. The concerned parents take them to the physician. Examination finds out that the internal sex organs are either underdeveloped or missing, but in fact this young woman has a pair of testes developing in her ab abdominal cavity. Okay. Let that one sink in for a minute. Okay. <laughs> yes? Let me show you how this works, and I think you'll see what's going on here. Okay? If you take the chrom if you if you take if you look at the chromosomes from these young women, there are XY. They, you expected them to develop as male. The product of the SRY gene is a protein called testes determining factor, or TFD. The role of TFD is to stimulate the fetal gonads to develop into testes. So she should have been male. The testes are developing. They're producing testosterone. The problem is at the next step down the vent is the receptor for the testosterone on the appropriate cells. So what you have, and you get more into this into cell biology, is you have a receptor on the outside of the cell that interacts with this steroid. That causes a translocation inside the cell and starts off this whole pathway of events that ultimately turns on gene expression. So the target cells have to respond to the testosterone to turn on a specific set of male-specific genes in those cells. However, the receptor is defective and it's not responding to the testosterone. So this woman will have male levels of testosterone, it's just the target cells can't respond to it. Yes? In this case, what? So it's, it's as I said, Female development is the default pathway. The fact that the system broke down, the testosterone is, is present, and the testosterone normally interacts with its target cells with these receptors, and they turn on a set of genes that are needed for further male development. But now the system's stalled. The, the target cells can't respond because the receptor is protected. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, that one I don't understand. Right. But what I would expect here is this woman actually has male levels of testosterone, but it can't develop further because the target cell can interact with because the receptor is broken. And so it's this cascade of events, and if something breaks down, then the whole system breaks down. Yes? Oh, then she would be stellar. Yeah. Yeah, the internal organs and such don't develop. Right. Yes? Is that the I think you know, that was sort of the rumor out there because the expectation is if, if they're really developing with higher levels of testosterone, they're probably probably have uh, more muscular inside. Yeah, and, and that gets into all this argument about who's male and who's female when it comes to things like the Olympics, which I find a curiosity, but I don't really get into too much. Yes? Did you refer to the depth of testosterone on the X? Oh, it's, okay, it's not. The, the gene that encodes the receptor is on the X. But basically through development, the receptor is in place. But there's a, a mutation so that that protein is non-functional. So in other words, you have a receptor on the surface that has to be, it's that lock and key model kind of thing. And it has to interact with the steroid. Usually what happens is the effector molecule, in this case the steroid, interacts with it. Two copies of the receptor come together, and that sets off this cascade of events. If that dimerization or any of that doesn't work, then the cell doesn't know the testosterone is there, and it will continue a female-specific developmental pathway. Yes. <coughs> as far as I understand, yes. You, if you look a quick point, you would she would look like she was female. No, 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 because. It, 
you know, the rest of the, the rest of the genes are not getting turned on properly. The main problem is the cells that normally would respond to the testosterone to develop male-specific tissues and such can't can't respond to it. So they're basically setting their default pathway. Yes, ma'am. You could, yeah, these genes have all been identified, sequenced, and such. So it's an interesting question. It goes to that, if I'm following your question, it goes to this idea of trying to do gene therapy in utero. Theoretically, yes. If you, I mean, you could, you could detect the genetic, if you had some reason to believe it was there, and you were looking for it, you could detect it uh, pre-implantation. Um, but... The problem is you probably aren't going to suspect it. If you have no reason to suspect it, then it's probably gone too far in development. These, these pathways are not reversible. Once the development goes to a certain extent, you don't get to just sort of start up again. But some of it, it goes to that question of whether you could do some of these gene therapy approaches in utero. And I'm not sure anybody's had any real success with that. Gene therapy itself... Uh, the first experiments were approved in 1990 by the NIH. And I recently read that somebody's maybe done, an ex done a gene therapy now that maybe has gotten some positive results. But otherwise, nobody's really been cured of a genetic disease from it. So it, it looked really promising at the beginning. But, and there is at least one case of a death associated with it. They were using adenovirus as the vector to target the transgene to the liver, and the young man had an unexpected reaction to the, the viral vector, and he died from it. So people are working on it. It's really complicated technology, but it, it may be getting there. So in theory, yes. In practice, no, not yet. Not that I know of. Somebody else have a question? I have a question. Yeah. Is that the reason some people, they appear to be in the society see them as female, but they feel inside that they are male or Good question. I have no idea what the answer to that is. All I will say is, and we'll get into this more when we get into genomics and such, the fact that the first human genome was, the sequence for the first of the human genome was first released only 11 years ago. It cost, thir took 13 years and it took billions of dollars and about 20 laboratories working on it. Now you can sequence a human genome in a couple of days for a few thousand dollars. Uh, the projection is about five years out, probably a thousand dollars to sequence the genome. So what they're doing now are large scale studies. There's one called the 2000 Genome Project. So what you're going to be able to do eventually is get the genetics of enough of these individuals who are having gender identity problems and such. And now you can start to look at the whole constellation of 25,000 genes. Then you might be able to begin to identify, you know, certain key genes. And it's not going to be just one. It could be a hundred or more. That might be able to put a link on that. And then I'm sure there's also going to be environmental cues. One difference between this edition of the textbook and the former one is this one's got much more on epigenetics. These ideas of epigenetics are anything that changes gene expression without actually changing the DNA sequence. And at first, when it was first examples were kind of found, it thought, okay, there's a few isolated cases. Now it's looking much and more widespread. So genetics over the next 10 years is going to get much more complicated. Yes? There is no SRY with the software. Oh, oh, okay. So a male, a male, an X O fly, which has just a single X and no no Y chromosome and no second X, will develop as a perfectly normal male, but he's sterile. Uh, not no. Actually, it's, it's due to non disjunction. We'll talk about. It, it's not common, but because in the laboratory we select the non common things, we can make it happen. So. Uh, all right. So any questions about this androgen sensitivity?
So it's, again, to make this point that you make a gene product, which is typically a protein. This is what you got to start thinking about is what's the product of these genes? Typically, it's a protein. So SRY makes this testes determining factor. This protein has to interact with the primordial gonads to develop into testes. The testes produce the testosterone. Testosterone is going through the system looking for its target cells. The target cells have a little receptor that says, oh, okay, here's the testosterone. That turns on another set of genes. But in this case, that receptor is broken, and the testosterone isn't bound. And so all the cells think they're on a female developmental pathway. Okay. Yes? That receptor is good. Uh, is there any other, like, mutations that can happen? Oh, sure. There's a whole signal transduction pathway. Um, I tend to get this in cell biology involving phosphorylation. And ultimately, there's another factor that ends up going into the nucleus to turn on gene expression. There's binding sites in there. We'll get into this later on. Basically, it turns on what are called transcriptional activators. These proteins have to bind to this DNA sequence to turn on gene expression. If that DNA sequence was mutated, it wouldn't work. So, yeah, there's lots of ways. It's amazing to me the system actually works. There's so many ways. When you start looking at biochemistry and the severe human disorders that can happen from a single enzyme mutation and such, I'm really, you know, I'm amazed the system works as well as it does. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, so I think this was just sort of to summarize things. Um, so sex development's influenced by SRY and other genes on other chromosomes. We've already talked about one of them. All right. So basically, everyone carries the genes for both male and female. It's how they're expressed. And that's really what this androgen and sensitivity syndrome is showing you, is that a chromosomal male ends up developing as a female because some of these other genes are defective. So sex development still ultimately depends on regulation of gene expression. It's a common theme we're going to keep coming back to. All right, so now let's look a little bit more into what you're more familiar with, sex link, inheritance of sex link genes. Again, the key to all of this, all the rules of Mendelian segregation, everything we talked about, all are in play here. It's just simply the fact that in males, there's only one X chromosome. Any genes that are present on the X that are not present on the Y, and that's very, very few of them, mean those males just have one copy. If there's a recessive mutation, you're going to see the recessive phenotype because there's no compensating wild type allele. So the segregation of the sex chromosomes, they pair and they segregate just like we talked about with the autosomes. It's just that there's just a single copy of the genes. And that's why we see sex-linked inheritance. Okay. So this was first found um, in Morgan's lab. So... As I said, Mendel's work was pretty much ignored for about 30 years or so. And then right around about the 1900s or so, several labs sort of rediscovered his work. But Morgan really put classical genetics on the map with his studies using Drosophila. So this goes back to uh, the early 1900s, about 1909. So we have a little over 100 years of genetics uh, working with Drosophila. As I said, Drosophila has a normal dark eye color. All right. But as they started working with this, they brought some strains into the lab and started working with them in the lab. They discovered a mutant that had white eyes. And there's all these stories about how normally what, in the early days, people would anesthetize the flies with ether so that they could look at them under a microscope. Uh, now we use carbon dioxide. Well, we've been using carbon dioxide for 30 years. It does it equally well. And there's these stories out there. The student saw this white-eyed fly and was going to sort of set it aside, and all of a sudden it woke up and flew around the room, and all these grad students are chasing this fly, trying to get it out of the lab. And such. But I don't know if that's urban legend or if that's actually true. All right. But they found this white-eyed mutant. So they started doing a set of experiments, genetic crosses with it. So this is the phenotype. So this is the normal eye. Drosophila's got this sort of big sort of oval eye, and it's this brick red color. So the gene we've talked about before, responsible for this is called the white locus or the white gene because when mutated you get white. So W plus is the wild type. 
W minus is the full mutant. All right. So part of this is to get you to see how you set up and think about an experiment. Instead of just randomly going in or going, well, my TA said do this and this and this, <laughs> kind of cookbook chemistry. And at the end, it didn't do this, and that's what we'll write up. Okay. So here's the question. Are white eyes and fruit flies inherited as an autosomal recessive trait? Okay. If they are, then remember from Mendel's work, he said reciprocal crosses give you the same result. So it shouldn't matter whether the female or the male has the white eyes. So he set up two parallel crosses. They had a red-eyed female cross to a white-eyed male, and a white-eyed female cross to a red-eyed male. Now, they're cheating a little bit here because they've already put the genes in and the gametes. So what we're looking at is, so this female, wild-type, probably going to have wild-type alleles. They just found the mutation. There's no reason to believe it would be in any other one. And this has to be the mutation, okay? So, and here's the gamete you can get. So this is cross one, then the reciprocal cross. Well, if this is a recessive mutation, she's going to have to be homozygous recessive for the white allele. And the male will be wild type on the X. So you look at the F1, and what you find is, with this cross, all the progeny have red eyes. If this was autosomal inheritance, we should also see all red eyes over here. But in fact, in this cross, the females have red eyes and the males have white eyes. So this is really the first sign that they're probably they're looking at something different than a typical Mendelian inheritance. Okay. So now let's go to the next generation, since mating brothers and sisters is fine with flies. <laughs> okay. Although they get a little embarrassed watching Jerry Springer too. But anyway. <laughs> It's a whole, that's another psychological problem. Okay, so now we're going to do this cross. And so what we find is, okay, we can get red-eyed females. So we end up with one-half red-eyed females, one-fourth red-eyed males, and one-fourth white-eyed males. In the other cross, we get a different outcome. Okay. So all of this being put together really brings to the conclusion that this is probably X-linked inheritance. That was the best way to explain it. And that the reciprocal crosses don't give you the same result. Okay. Why was it probable if, okay, they're starting to work with flies. They bring in these flies from outside, from the banana plantations, wherever they got them. Why was it likely, knowing what we know now, that the first you know, clearly phenotypic mutant that they would find would probably be X-linked. Why is it easier to find X-linked mutations than to find mutations on the autosomes? Yes? Because with X-linked, the males have no uh, backup. Exactly. Since they're effectively haploid for that mutation, so it was actually easier. Many of the first mutations that were found in the software were all on the X chromosome because you can pick them up in one generation. You're not going to see if that was an autosomal mutation. You'd have to go to at least the second generation to be able to see it. <clears throat> OK, so Morgan correctly concluded that the gene for eye color was on the X chromosome, and that the Y chromosome does not have a corresponding allele. That's why you saw it. That's the only reason. So males are said to be hemizygous, only partially. They only have a partial complement of the X genes. So any of these individuals, if you have only one copy of the sex chromosome, then we use the term being hemizygous. And as he just pointed out, if there's only one allele present, you're going to see the recessive. Even if it's recessive, in most mutations are recessive, you're going to see the recessive phenotype. Okay. Any questions about that? That's probably pretty, just sort of a refresher from the general biology. Okay. One of the other students, one of the students in Morgan's lab named Calvin Bridges, very observant individual, he was working on these crosses, and as we just showed over here, when you cross the white-eyed females with the right-eyed males, you should get 
All the females should have red eyes. All the males should have white. What we notice is in a small percentage of the progeny, the traits were reversed. So since you have typically, if you get 100, a female can lay three or 400 eggs and such. So you can have hundreds of progeny to look at. He found a few white-eyed females and red-eyed males, the reverse of what was expected. But just a small percentage, about a couple of percent. So the question was, what's causing that? So what he proposed was this phenomenon of non-disjunction. The way he explained it was, and then he did, so he, he had a hypothesis now of how he thinks this is happening, and then he can design an experiment to test that hypothesis. So his hypothesis was that occasionally the 2X chromosomes at anaphase 1, they're supposed to split, okay, and you get one X chromosome going to each side. Well, the centimeters don't split, but you have one homologue going to each side and developing one X chromosome in each cell, that occasionally that splitting process fails. And two X chromosomes go to one cell and no X chromosomes go to the other. So it's non-disjunction. They don't just don't disjoin properly. So in this case, one egg gets two X chromosomes and the other has no sex chromosomes. Then when fertilized by a, star, a sperm from a red-eyed male, you get four possible genotypes. Okay. So here's the experiment. You ask this question. You always start with a question. In a cross between white-eyed female and red-eyed males, why are there a few white-eyed females and red-eyed males? Notice why does a small percentage of the progeny have the opposite phenotype that you expect? And this was his hypothesis about non-disjunction. So you set it up. You have a white-eyed female. But the key here, and he was probably lucky in doing this, is that Y chromosome. Okay. If it didn't work this way, or if that Y chromosome wasn't present, you, you could work your way through this without the Y chromosome. You'll see how the results get a little more confusing. But it made it very easy to see it here. So this is XXY, but this is, and for Drosophila, this is a perfectly normal, fertile female. Okay, and he's saying 90% of the time, but most of the time, you get the normal segregation. So these are the, the two gametes you would normally get. All right, you got three sex chromosomes, so they can't partition equally. So most of the time, you get one X in each one, and a Y goes to the other one. But sometimes, the two X chromosomes go together. And the Y chromosome is over here by itself. So you can actually get four different gametes out of this situation. Over here, the male, this is just the normal situation. This is a wild-type male, okay, and you get X plus in a Y chromosome. So now when you look at the different fertilizations that can come out of this, the top four are what you get from the normal segregation of the sex chromosome, which is exactly what we expected before. Red-eyed females, white-eyed males. However, here, you have the egg with the 2X chromosome, and if that gets fertilized by a sperm with an X chromosome, you get a meta-female, the three Xs and she dies. Fertilized with a Y sperm, you get a white-eyed female. Still XXY, but because 2X is perfectly fine female. Down here, you get a normal red-eyed male. And here, you get two Y chromosomes. And because there's no X chromosome, that individual dies. So he had a hypothesis. He set it up. I set up the experiment. And the results of his experiment support his conclusion that once in a while, the sex chromosomes fail to disjoin and segregate properly. Okay. Any questions about non-disjunction? Yes. No, no, this this can this is probably what's responsible for most, for instance, spontaneous abortion in humans. It's just non disjunction of the chromosome. He basically exploited this situation to be able to show this experimentally. But yeah, it doesn't have to be this. It's just sometimes, even under normal conditions, the two, it could be autosomes, it could be the sex chromosome. So sometimes they just, the two homologous pairs just travel together during anaphase one. They don't separate. And that's what, and this is what you end up with.
normally in a ma but you try to do this experiment with mammals and everything, you're never going to find them because they, they spontaneously avoid. It's also another reason for when you design your experiments, choose your model system appropriately. Okay. So a couple things came out. It's not only did bridges show this non-disjunction, but what seems obvious to us now, but it wasn't necessarily at that time, was the suspicion that these genes, these genetic factors that Mendel talked about, resided on the chromosome. But it really wasn't clear scientific evidence to support this. These experiments clearly show that the genes have to be associated with the chromosomes. Changing chromosome segregation changes the genetic outcome. Okay. So this started into play Drosophila as a model organism. So on the very first lecture I showed you several model organisms. So sort of a difference between let's say field science and lab science. It, a lot, if you're doing ecological studies and such, you're out dealing with nature and you basically get what nature gives you and if it may rain or it may be too hot or whatever. In the lab we're trying to manipulate the system. We're trying to control it. And what you find is with all of these model systems from E. coli to yeast to C. elegans, Drosophila, mouse, zebrafish and such, you have an array of tools available to you, both genetic and molecular tools. Now the genomes are all sequenced. And so that's really what happens here. One of the values of Drosophila is we've got genetics going back 100 years um, on this organism. And so now it's actually being used to understand things about gene linkage. We'll talk about that, I think, in Chapter 7 or something. Epistasis, something we'll talk about in the next chapter, chromosome structure and function, but also getting into development. We've already talked a little bit about that, sex determination. Neurobiology. Uh, we have five, I think, five of the neurobiologists on the faculty are all up at Jupiter now. They all use Drosophila as their model system because they can do the microscopy and the genetics and the molecular biology, uh, imaging it with the microscope. They have lots of tools available to work with it. Uh, behavior, memory and learning. Ron Davis, who heads up neurobiology at Scripps, is using Drosophila to study memory and learning. Uh, and even doing evolutionary studies now. Um, this is actually a picture of Morgan's lab. This was the fly lab. Kind of looks like some dorm rooms, I remember. But uh, you can't really tell it here. These are little, they're little glass milk bottles. They're sometimes they're, you might find them now in something like Cracker Barrel or something selling them. But milk back in the early 1900s was sold in these little half pint bottles or pint bottles, whatever. And they actually used it for culturing the Drosophila. So we use something similar to that now, but we live in a disposable society, so our containers are plastic. But a small container like that, you can raise four or 500 flies in there. Um, if you haven't seen them, the Drosophila are very, very tiny. So, um, oh, I don't know. Way back before we had other Drosophila geneticists, I was talking, and we were actually, biology used to be and was now behavioral sciences building. We were in that building. And I was on the second floor, actually, in my office. I looked out from my current office window and watched my whole lab get shoved off into dumpsters and such where they were remodeling it. But I was just talking about bringing Drosophila in, and then every damn fly that anybody found in that building, they, sure, they thought for sure it was mine. <laughs> I said, I'm only talking, I haven't even brought them in yet. But since most of the genetic lines that we use in the lab have white eyes, the ones they would bring me all had red eyes and looked like they were on steroids if they were Drosophila. So. What I learned is the flies, when they escape, though, they go to somebody else's lab. <laughs> so, Okay. So here's just a couple of the reasons. I've, I've, we can go through it quickly because I've said this before. So these are really the hallmarks that you want for a good genetic model system. So relatively short generation time with flies, we can get them about every 10 to 14 days. You can manipulate this with temperature a little bit, but generally it works like this. You get a lot of progeny. Uh, the females uh, can lay four or 500 eggs over about a 10-day period. They're pretty easy to maintain. Uh, I used to use these little, like I said, these little pint milk bottles. Um, when I was in California, we actually, the, the whole genetics department was almost all fly just genetics. And so there was a woman whose half-time job was just running the fly kitchen. 
And so she had some students who would have, and they were still using these glass bottles. It was California. It was Davis. They're always into recycling and conservation and bicycles and everything. So they had students who could get paid to take these old disgusting bottles with fly larvae and everything else in them and run them through this massive dishwasher, garbage disposal thing to clean them up. And then the technician would cook up several, oh, probably 30 or 40 liters of fly food and then dispense them all out into the bottle. So you just put in your order and... Uh, and so it took somebody 20 hours a week to be able to make enough fly food to keep all the labs running. Uh, it has a fairly small genome. As we get more into the molecular genetics, we'll get to this point about the sheer size of these genomes. So smaller genomes make it easier to work with. Just so you start to learn some of this shorthand. So the genome was about 175 megabase pairs. MBP, so that would be millions. So it's about 175 million base pairs. That equals 175,000 kilo base pairs or thousand base pairs, or about 1.7 times 10 to the eighth base pairs. All right. The whole sequence of this was actually finished in 2000. So this, the genome of Drosophila was finished 13 years, no, 11 years before the human genome was finished. No, is that right? No, I'm sorry, only three years. But the human genome is about 20 fold larger. So in comparison to size, Drosophila has got a smaller genome. It's got this limited number of chromosomes. So the X chromosome, some people call it, you might see it in some literature somewhere, it's chromosome 1, but hardly anybody uses that term. It's chromosome, it's the X chromosome. There's two large chromosomes, chromosome 2 and 3. The two genes that we work with, methionine sulfoxide, reductase A and B, are both on the third chromosome. Chromosome 4 is really small. And nobody paid any attention to it until recently because it was just too hard to work with. And they have something called giant polyteen chromosomes, which also provided some experimental advantage. Later on, I'll tell you what that, that was. But all of these are just coming together as to why the Drosophila is a really nice model system. Okay. Um, so any, any questions about flies and such? Although I've seen in the past some students on their spot evaluations talks about the software too much. All right. What else? What are we going to do? All right. So excellent color blindness. Something I know about because I am color blind. Um, so I dress myself every morning, and then my wife says, "You're not wearing. You're lecturing today. Yes. Then get a different shirt." And it's like for 20 years, just pick it out ahead of time. I don't know. She has this incredible eye for color. She used to work in the fashion business and merchandising. And after all these years, she still can't figure out, I don't know what they are. <laughs> or she still goes, did you see that pink house on the corner? What was in the front yard? It's like, no, because I have no idea what pink, the pink house is. All right. So what is color blindness all about? It turns out that there's three pigments that receive the different wavelengths of light. And be, depending on their response, they trigger these different colors perceptions in your brain. These were cloned and studied a number of years ago, and in most cases, these mutations cause changes in the pigment so they respond to a different wavelength of light. So I literally see the world in a different light. It's responding to different wavelengths. I also think I may be correct and you're wrong. Okay? <laughs> it's just an argument for semantics. Okay. So males are hemizygous for genes on the X. So mutations in these pigment genes are recessive, so it's going to show the typical sex-linked inheritance. Uh, so sometimes the term that's used for this is kind of a crisscross inheritance. It alternates between generations. So in most cases, since sons inherit the X chromosome from their mother, you sort of see this alternation of generations. Um, okay, is there any reason? So here's just to kind of show it in a diagrammatic form. So now the mother is wild type for normal vision, father's colorblind, so you end up with um, all the daughters are now obligate carriers. So my daughter, assuming I'm the father, is an obligate carrier. Okay. I, I used to tell her, I said, I know how to do those experiments. I can do those experiments. And she knows it too. Okay. Now my daughter looks, unfortunately, she. Overall, she takes after her mother, which is good, but she has, like, my fingers and stuff. You can tell. <laughs> my kid. All right. Good kid, anyway. 
So this is all you're looking at. It's just another example of this X-linked inheritance. And it's just because the males just have one copy. Uh, in the reciprocal cross, this just gives you the outcome. I don't think there's any reason to be late. Our heterogametic, and would have, if you had the same situation, they would be the ones showing the recessive mutation instead of the males. Okay. Why linked in uh, characteristics? This is turning out to be kind of useful for some, uh, oh, sort of family tree studies and some genotyping and such. Okay. So, as I said, the Y chromosome is small. It only has a limited number of genes on it. Uh, probably about 75 protein coding sequences have been found. About 65% is something called heterochromatin. We'll get into that in a later chapter. But heterochromatin is these large tracts in our genome that don't appear to have any, uh, they don't have to appear to have any active transcription going on in them. However, at least unlike the X chromosome, the Y chromosome can be traced through a lineage because it's exclusively inherited from father to son. Okay? So you can find genetic markers. All we mean, and this is, you know, all of the whole CIS and the DNA profiles and the polymorphisms, and they're going to put it in CODIS, and I'll tell you later on what CODIS is and everything else, is all based on just looking for genetic variation between one individual and another. So there are some genetic variations that have been found for the Y chromosome, so they can be used to basically identify specific individuals. So one that was, this came out a couple of years ago, so there had always sort of been in the history books uh, suggestion that Thomas Jefferson actually had at least one child with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings. And so, and the question was, is that really true or not and such. But it turns out that Jefferson had a rare one of these mutations on the Y chromosome. It was literally tracked down through his descendants through about 200 years now. All right. And doing all of that, they found that uh, Hemings' first son, uh, they, they did this with Hemings' first son, last son, and uncle of Jefferson, the descendants of them through over those 200 years. Because it was rare they could actually show very good statistical argument that, in fact, Jefferson was the father of the last or last son, but not the first son. So this came back to get him 200 years later. Okay. <laughs> so in the last couple of minutes, what I think I'll do is I'm just going to introduce this idea of dosage compensation. It might be an idea that we, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll revisit this on Wednesday. Okay, so here's the problem. Females have two X chromosomes, males have one X chromosome. So females have two copies of all the genes on the X chromosome, males only have one. There's a genetic imbalance here. But we need a system where, in fact, at the gene expression level, the activity, the expression of those genes is equal in both males and females. And so again, Drosophila and mammals have solved this problem and came to the same outcome but in two different ways. In Drosophila, what happens is the X chromosome, the two X chromosomes in the female both remain active. There is no bar body, there's no loss of an X chromosome, but the one X chromosome in males is hyperactivated. Simply means the genes are twice as active. They transcribe at twice the rate and each gene makes twice as many mRNA molecules. So in the end, the gene expression is still the same. So in Drosophila, they solve this dosage problem by making the genes on the X chromosome in males work harder, work faster. Okay. Hmm. Mammals have taken a, an opposite approach. And you should be somewhat familiar with this, the so-called bar bodies. So the idea here is inactivate all but one of the X chromosomes which is probably why these sex chromosome aneuploidies are tolerated, because all but one X chromosome becomes inactivated. So if you have more than two X chromosomes, again, all but one. Um, this inactivated X chromosome basically condenses on itself, and it shows up as a very darkly staining DNA-rich mass when you look under the microscope, and this is the so-called bar body. So you're using a stain that's 
specifically stains DNA. You can see this dense bar body in the nucleus. Okay. So, I think it leads up to an interesting point where I want to stop is for females who are heterozygous for a gene on the X chromosome, they are actually genetic mosaics. So, because what's going to happen is as development is occurring and the cells are dividing, at some point, there's a molecular mechanism that says, let's inactivate this X chromosome. When that X chromosome becomes inactivated, all of the descendant cells from that cell all inactivate the same X chromosome. Let's say it's the maternal X chromosome. But over here, as far as we can tell, this is a random process. Over here in these cells, it could be the paternal X chromosome that gets inactivated. So if there's a wild-type gene on the maternal X and a recessive mutation on the paternal X, then these cells are expressing the mutated gene, and these cells are expressing the wild type gene. So they're functionally, females are functionally hemizygous at the molecular level. And if they're heterozygous for a gene, they're genetic mosaics. Some cells are expressing one allele, some cells are expressing another. Okay. So I'll just, I think I'll just leave it at that so that when we come back. So this is just an example of it, this calico cat. We'll come back to this example and show you how this genetic mosaicism works.